previous, uh, in previous lectures of this series, uh, which is called Plural Perspectives on Health and Health Policy, uh, we've had lectures on historical trauma. We've had lectures on micro insults. Really challenging us to think about the role and, and the different ways of conceptualizing uh, illness and disease. Well, today's speaker uh, will challenge us yet again to think about illness and disease causation that transcend the typical biomedical uh, framework that so often is used in healthcare delivery. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Janet Shim from the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Shim received her master's degree in public policy at Harvard University and a PhD at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and her research interests uh, span a number of areas, including aging and the extension uh, of life practices, as well as what we're going to talk about today, class and gender and a variety of other things. Because today's lecture is entitled Embodied Inequality, Heart <coughs> Disease and the Politics of Causation. So without further ado, let me turn over the mic to, or the podium, to Professor Janet Shim. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming and spending a little time uh, with me. And um, first of all, I just want to really extend my warm thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Center for Health Policy for the invitation to come and speak with you. Um, and I'm looking forward, I'm hoping that after I finish talking today that we can have a, a nice lively discussion about some of the things that my talk brought up, um, as well as any other kinds of conversations that you might have about other uh, interests of mine um, that, and interests that you might share with me. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm looking forward to conversations today, tomorrow, and then hopefully uh, beyond that. And I understand that there's a group of you who are uh, coming from a class on um, medical Spanish, so I just want to send a special welcome to you. And um, hopefully there will be some things in here that um, you'll be able to take back and think about um, in terms of thinking about what the clinical implications are um, and in terms of what it means to be health literate and biomedically literate in today's age. Okay. So what I want to talk today uh, about is a nexus of issues that I've been grappling with um, for quite some time. And it's a nexus that coalesces around the question of disease causation and the difference that difference makes in health and well-being. I came to this question because I was trying to make sense of why, despite a now vast body of knowledge about heart disease and its causes, deep and systematic inequalities still persist in who develops heart disease, who lives with it, and who dies from it. Given all that we know about heart disease, its inequitable, its inequitable burden should hardly be a scientific mystery or as challenging a policy problem as it is. Yet the reasons for and the reduction of serious disparities in the incidence and distribution of heart disease continue to elude us. <coughs> so to place this within a larger picture, let me explain for a minute what I mean by the politics of causation. First, what we, or any given society, constitutes a cause of disease is not given by nature, but rather is the product of our particular historical accepted notions of what can be a cause of disease. For example, the era of modern medicine required convincing scientists, clinicians, and the public that the causes of illness were not divine or spiritual, but rather were natural agents interacting with biological bodies. Second, the ways in which we, can de the ways in which we determine whether X is a, is a cause of disease Y are likewise socially described. That is, techniques of legitimation, of ascertainment, and verification are socially and historically specific. How we believe truth and facts can be and should be discovered are tied to beliefs about how we can authenticate and substantiate what is real and how things work. What follows then is that not anyone can define and legitimate disease causes. Some kinds of knowledges are deemed to be more credible than others based on, uh, based on how they are produced and who produces them. Some forms of knowledge are seen as expertise, and others are merely anecdote or subjective experience. This, of course, begs the question of who gets to decide our standards of credibility, how we evaluate the evidence, what constitutes proof, and the boundaries between what is science and what is not, what is expertise, and what is not. All in all, the questions that these issues raise are, 
what is science, and who does science. My contention is that the ways in which we answer these questions are intimately intertwined with politics and power. <clears throat> that is, in our society, having access to knowledge, having the right kinds of knowledge, and having the ability to produce knowledge are <coughs> stratified. In such a knowledge stratified society, then, what counts as proof, expertise, and science can't help us end up with power and politics. Given that we base so much of what we know about disease causation in scientific knowledge produced by scientific experts, that is, on a particular kind of knowledge produced by a particular kind of knower, our conceptions of disease causes and the practices that we use to identify them are thoroughly political. And so this is what I mean by the politics of causation. So there are multiple examples of where we can see the politics of causation in action. For instance, scholars have traced how women's health and environmental activists, as well as epidemiologists, have contested the idea that breast cancer is predominantly the result of women's behavioral and biological risk factors. Instead, they've argued vociferously for research that considers the potential role of environmental exposures. The same goes for autism, which has seen a dramatic escalation in incidence. Parents and others in the audience will probably remember the recent controversies about the role of childhood vaccines in triggering the onset of autism, and the U.S. government's efforts to quell that controversy through research, which found no discernible association. However, contestation over autism's causes has not gone away, and indeed there's now a burgeoning scientific community interested in investigating the impact of environmental factors. Even in the case of infectious disease, which is kind of the poster child for the modern medicine era, there is now an effort to try to understand why some populations are so systematically and differentially vulnerable. This necessitates a shift in thinking about the cause of an infectious disease as not only a virus or a bacterium or some other kind of pathogen, but also poverty, mar marginalization, and other forces that place people at risk of risks. So this brings me to my own research on heart disease, in which I wanted to examine the politics of causation for a condition that, well, is not really highly politicized or highly contested, where it seems like we know most everything we need to know in order to intervene effectively. We've known about many of the risk factors for heart disease since the 1980s, and public health campaigns and clinical advice about how to prevent heart disease are pretty much everywhere. And my guess is that if I asked you guys to recite for me what the risk factors of heart disease are, most of you would probably know most of them. Yet it remains the number one cause of death for humans, killing over 600,000 people in the U.S. and over 17 million people globally each year. And as I mentioned at the outset, there are systematic inequalities in the morbidity and mortality of heart disease. So let me just show you some quick statistics. These are by race and ethnicity. Um, in this first um, table, we see death, or this first graph, we see uh, death rates for heart disease. Males are on the left, females are on the right, broken out by the major U.S. census racial ethnic categories. So primarily the bar that um, you know, I would like for you to note is the second one, which notes that the, dispor the disproportionately high rates of heart disease mortality for African Americans. Let me just scroll forward. Here we have death rates from coronary heart disease, which is a particular type of cardiovascular disease, and the pattern looks pretty much the same. And then here are the prevalence rates for hypertension. This is how, um, this is the percent of the population of each group which reports having hypertension or high blood pressure. And here we have things shown in um, black and white, and that's kind of the male systematic inequalities, I wanted to ask, is there even a politics of causation for this prevalent, ubiquitous condition? Where are its causes being contested? Among and between whom? And in what ways? So over the past 10 odd years, I've conducted participant observation at epidemiologic conferences and health education events, in-depth interviews with epidemiologists and people of color diagnosed with heart disease, and content analysis of the literature on the practice of epidemiology. And in particular, in doing and engaging in these data collection methodologies, I was interested in how epidemiologists and laypersons understand the role of race, gender, and class differences in heart disease causation. How do they think about the influences of these social differences and how they produce health or sickness? And what I found is that they answer this question of how difference matters 
in quite distinct ways. So I wanted to share uh, three sets of findings from my research, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus uh, most of my discussion largely on my findings around race. So first I found that epidemiologists conceive of racial difference largely in cultural terms, where culture is seen as a static, intrinsic, and deterministic trait of individuals and groups. But I argue that we also need to look beyond just the content of these epidemiologic conceptions and practices about difference and consider the condition of their production. So second, I'll discuss how norms, contingencies, and politics are integral to why epidemiologists individualize race, almost regardless of their actual beliefs about the complexity of race and its effects. And then finally, I want to pre uh, present some alternatives to epidemiologic thinking about difference. And for that, I'll turn to lay people's accounts of race and the role that they play in black and heart disease. And I'll try to show how those who live with heart disease disagree, often quite dramatically, with the logic of racist culture. They contend that the origins of heart disease disparities are to be found in the social relations that tie dominant and subordinate groups to one another. Their experiences of racial inequality and the knowledges that they construct from them give us a window into thinking about how power relations based upon definitions of difference stratify people's exposures to health risks. Lay people, therefore, offer a very different kind of politics of causation than do epidemiologists, a politics that invokes the significance of inequality, discrimination, and relations of power in your general health. So throughout this discussion, I'll occasionally pose the issue of gender as an interesting counterpoint to that of race. And I find that it's provocative because the notion of gender differences and heart disease as rooted in biology <coughs> is so uncontroversial in medical and epidemiologic circles. The nature of gender is far less contested in epidemiology than the nature of race. Yet, as I will show, the discipline treats um, and incorporates these differences um, in uh, very similar kinds of ways. And neither epidemiologic constructions of race nor those on gender are taken to any significant extent by lay people. So I think that tracing how these two scientific entities end up faring so similarly says much about the practice of epidemiology, how it produces what it knows, and what is at stake in defining the causes of disease. So before I get into um, the meat of these findings, let me say a couple words about epidemiology for those of you who might not be so familiar with this discipline. So the discipline of epidemiology involves the science of disease, distribution, determinants, and frequency. Because it constitutes the official source of knowledge about disease causation, it plays a really critical role in shaping our understandings about health and prevention, and it's a really prominent ingredient in guiding health policy and decision making. And more specifically, I argue that in the routine activities of epidemiologic data collection, analysis, interpretation, and dissemination, this discipline of epidemiology <coughs> makes and remakes conceptions about race. For all of its prominence, however, epidemiology has been critiqued on a number of counts. First, its tendency to be myopic about individual risk factors. So here, for example, is a doctor telling Humpty Dumpty that the cracks can be fixed. It's your cholesterol level that worries me. Right? Humpty Dumpty said I <laughs> so second, um, if you just do a Google search for cartoons about epidemiology and public health, there's like a ton. <laughs> um, so second, epidemiology is constant reporting that exposure to X or consumption of Y leads to disease Z, often leads to a kind of public fatigue that, well, anything can cause anything. And then finally, there's the occasional need for epidemiology to reverse itself, such that everything you thought that was good for you is now bad for you. So all of these attributes have provided steady fodder for the evening news and the local cartoons. But this is pretty serious and consequential stuff. So recall, for example, that a whole generation of women um, took hormone replacement therapy under the mistaken assumption that it provided cardiovascular benefits, only to find that HRT actually not only increased um, their risk for cardiac events, but also contributed to their risk for breast cancer. All right, so back to epidemiology. Um, race is most often measured by self-classification into one of the racial and ethnic categories standardized by the Office of Management and Budget. And I would imagine all of you guys being in this institution that is the university, you're pretty well familiar with each of these boxes and which boxes that you check, under what kinds of circumstances, and so on and so 
Yet in my research, I found that researchers readily express pretty profound uncertainties about the meanings of race, its appropriate measures, and interpretations, and what kinds of implications it has for um, disease prevention and public health policy. They repeatedly raise concerns about the problematic measurement of race, which for them leads to doubts about data reliability, a more or less technical issue of whether the recorded race of an individual accurately reflects her or his actual, actual race. But researchers often wondered about more fundamental epistemological questions about the nature of race itself. For example, what race means in a multiracial world, what phenomena exactly are being captured in the variable of race, and the utility and significance of findings of racial differences for clinical and public health. Epidemiologists also view the sensitivity of racial categories to social forces as scientifically troubling. Categories can just appear, they disappear, they change their meaning in response to social, cultural, and political trends. Although such modifications may be politically desirable, such instability renders the variable of race ill-suited for conducting epidemiologic research. Yet despite scientists' misgivings about race as a scientific entity, my analysis showed that it is pretty ritualistically included in epidemiologic research. It's used to um, routinely and often uncritically um, limit or, or describe study samples, as well as to stratify and adjust results. One researcher, for example, described the inclusion of race as something everybody just has to do, a procedure that once may have come with explicit justifications, but that's now it's now so taken for granted that epidemiologists perceive it as a standard operating procedure. And in so doing, investigators implicitly infuse race with multiple meanings and definitions. Most predominantly, they interpreted the meanings of racial differences through what I call a cultural prism. That is, they tend to attribute racial disparities to cultural differences, such as those related to diet, attitudes about exercise, and beliefs about health and the body. Epidemiologists repeatedly refer to these differences being of a cultural or ethnic nature, related to the customary values and practices of a racially or ethnically defined social group. I found that the popularity of a cultural construction of race can be attributed to several aspects of the conception of culture that contribute to its scientific and its social utility. First, cultural readings of racial differences were perceived as factual in that they are descriptive of outwardly observable <coughs> habits and customs that pose different kinds of cardiovascular risks and benefits for different racial groups. Second, cultural constructions of race resonate particularly well with health promotion and risk reduction mandates. Viewing race through the prism of culture provides an extremely convenient entry point to targeting risky lifestyle behaviors, such as diet, that are a focus of heart disease research and the mainstay of prevention discourses. And third, cultural practices were seen as a politically acceptable way to talk about differences among ethnic groups without insinuating that races differ in some biological way. And instead, aspects of behavior and beliefs, rather than the interior of the body, are held responsible, discursively distancing claims of cultural variations from politically troubling assertions of biological essentialism. By doing so, epidemiologists attempted to distance themselves from the controversial debates about race and biology and thereby protect the credibility of their research. Let me now turn briefly to epidemiologic perspectives on sex and gender. Now, even though sex versus gender mean very different things in the eyes of most social scientists, epidemiologists often refer to them almost interchangeably. Sex, or gender, is considered a crucial axis of analysis because of its definition as a biologically meaningful difference. In conferences and publications, for example, researchers rarely explicitly justify stratifying samples or analyzing data by sex. Their interpretations of sex-differentiated results, when they were offered, most often relied on biological explanations. In interviews, when asked to explain the significance of gender in heart disease etiology, and explicitly asked them about gender, separately from and in addition to sex, epidemiologists cited physiological differences between women and men. And in fact, the prevailing themes related to sex and gender in these interviews were hormone replacement therapy and menopause or, as one of the has been put it, the estrogen connection. The biological distinctiveness of heart disease in <coughs> women versus men is thus considered the natural order of 
But recall that very little about race and market contrast seems to be natural or settled in the world of epidemiology, not its measurement, not its reliability, nor its meaning. Yet the practice of including race, like the inclusion of sex, as a variable characterizing individual subjects and used to analyze results is considered necessary and routine. Race and sex, along with age, make up the holy trinity for epidemiologists, as one described it, so much so that their measurement and inclusion often do not warrant specific mention in, in presentations about research methodology or analysis. And in fact, a lot of the epidemiologists that I observed at conferences and whom I interviewed talk about what they call the usual suspects, or controlling for the usual suspects, as sort of a shorthand gloss for the practice of controlling for sex, race, and age. This language of the usual suspects is indicative of the extent to which the inclusion of these variables is viewed as routine and unremarkable, just the standard operating procedure that everybody has to comply with. So paradoxically, however, um, as I alluded to, the technical routine of this usual suspects approach <coughs> is subjected to some fairly fundamental questioning from a growing number of epidemiologists. In addition to their questions about the stability, reliability, and validity of the variable of race that I alluded to earlier, some also argue that simply including race among the usual suspects is a methodological practice that may be necessary, but it's by no means sufficient. Where these usual suspects at least partially account for group differences in outcomes, this is perceived not as a finding that requires further investigation, but as, a respect, as an expected result precisely because these variables are thought of as being the usual suspects. And in fact, some of the epidemiologists I spoke with claim that adjusting for race, in fact, adjusts away the very disparities to which they should attend. And in turn, such an erasure serves to focus research on factors other than the effects of race. And as a result, those variables that are used as controls become technical and routine procedures performed in the service of other research objectives rather than the focus of study in and of themselves. But these kinds of reservations about the methodological treatment of race only occasionally bubbled up in the debates that they have about findings and interpretations, and rarely trickle down to affect the research practices in which they engage. Why and how is it that the inclusion of individualized measures of race along with sex has become so black box, even when the contents of the black boxes are under dispute? I argue that it is because the technical routine has become integral to the construction of scientific credibility and the management of uncertainty. So let me turn to some of those findings in the research. So scientific and uh, social credibility rests upon successfully fulfilling a number of political, methodological, and economic contingencies. And I've listed here some that I identified in my research. The usual suspects approach offers a way to minimally comply with these contingencies, and in so doing, promotes the production of credible epidemiologic claims. And in turn, this practice then becomes further removed. And I want to briefly describe the latter two of these contingencies here, the ones that are highlighted in here. So the first methodological contingency I'd like to discuss is what I call the measurement and character. So the work of epidemiologists often involves research on indeterminate phenomena using uncertain methods. In cardiovascular epidemiology, for example, or the epidemiology of heart disease, part of the objective of much research is to determine the complex etiology of a disease whose causes are multiple. These causes can be synergistic, where they might counteract one another. They often vary from person to person and from place to place. And so in the face of such complexity, grounds for the credibility of a piece of research have to be carefully constructed. One way in which a case for credibility can be built is through the comprehensive measurement and inclusion of all possible contributing, intervening, mediating factors to the phenomena under question. Investigators therefore experience pressures to quantify and incorporate all variables that may play a role in disease causation. As the body of evidence accumulates that something about race influences heart disease, the measurement imperative mandates that some aspects of these differences be measured in some fashion. Moreover, in the face of imperfect information about what exactly about race is significant for disease, an overly inclusive and simplistic measure, like the simple blanket variable of race, is preferable to overly specific ones, 
that by aiming to be more precise, may end up missing relevant factors related to race. So in short, any measurement, even inadequate measurement, is seen as better than no measurement at all. <coughs> Thus, epidemiologists, from those who agree that current measures are somewhat ambiguous, to those who are really emphatic that they're completely fundamentally flawed, all of them still make do with relatively crude measures of representing race, and they habitually use them in their research. And it's under these conditions that are imposed by the measurement imperative that there can exist significant uncertainty over the adequacy of current measures of race simultaneously with their root known conclusion. So a certain contingency which sustains the ritualized inclusion of the usual suspects has to do with the economic conditions under which epidemiologists do their work. Specifically, epidemiologists argue that in order to come to credible conclusions about disparities in disease, they require sample sizes with carefully defined subpopulations that are large enough to conduct separate analyses of adequate statistical power. They also advocate longitudinal research following individuals and communities for extended periods of time. However, such studies are extremely expensive and logistically difficult to conduct. Moreover, even if detailed and longitudinal data sets were available, Epidemiologists point out that conceptual models and techniques for analyzing such complex data are still in development. These constraints represent crucial tools for the job that have not yet been fully elaborated, much less widely stabilized or accepted. Epidemiologists uniformly perceive that such methodological problems are, as one put it, a kiss of death for funding. As a result, existing methodologies that include simplistic measures of race, although often regarded as inadequate, continue to be used as stopgap and good enough variables to nominally account for differences that epidemiologists know to be significant, though in ways they cannot conclusively state. In short, the ritualized practice of including race and gender, understood as a cultural and biological difference respectively, holds significant currency as an organizing concept and a collective approach for cardiovascular epidemiology. Researchers mobilize cultural interpretations of race because they oppose simplistic biological explanations and they want to acknowledge the scientific and the societal value of cultural diversity. And with that understanding in mind, yet constrained by the need to satisfy numerous contingencies to produce uh, credible research, epidemiologists resort to using standardized categories as based in their work. These categories serve a vital purpose for scientists who, despite their best intentions and sometimes deep misgivings, are hard pressed to find an alternative method that meets that fundamental need to achieve credibility. This now ritualized technique functions as a black box whose use raises fundamental questions about its validity, yet in practice it proves quite robust. Thus, even though the nature of race is contested to a much greater extent than the nature of gender, epidemiologists treat and incorporate these differences in very similar ways as technical routines and analytic endpoints rather than points of departure for further inquiry. These practices routinize the conceptualization of race and gender as individualized, astructural notions of difference and sustain a focus on disease causation at the level of the individual. Now, to consider what some alternatives to epidemiologic conceptions of difference may be, let me now turn to my analysis of lay people's accounts of race and gender. So, whereas epidemiologic accounts focus on culture, culturalist notions of race and then biological notions of gender, lay narratives reveal more nuanced understandings of the impacts of race and gender on health that invoke more macrostructural influences. In my interviews with African Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinos with heart disease, most articulate how race and gender work together to structure their everyday experiences and life chances that in turn affect their health. While their notions of race and gender are highly variable, they're complicated, they're messy, they're contradictory, lay people overall talk about the risks posed by race and gender in terms of the consequences inequality has on their sense of self, their everyday interactions, and on their economic and environmental conditions of life. So let me describe each of these in turn. First, lay participants describe a pervasive, oppressive sense of double consciousness as contributing to their cardiovascular risk. 
For example, one respondent, who I'll call Rodolfo, describes an inescapable sense of otherness where he feels forced to see himself as others see him, as black, as defined by his skin color, even though this is not the way that he sees himself. Being black, quote, has conditioned everything that I am. It's really difficult. You can't relax. You always have to have a mask. Your emotions are negatively affected day in and day out by the fact that you're black. And not a single day goes by where you're not reminded of this. So yes, my health is generally affected by the fact that I'm black. Such feelings engender for people deep conflicts between their desire to fight and resist and their need to survive and just get by. For example, Jeline, an immigrant from the Philippines who had been a highly visible anti-Marcos political activist, describes the pain of her immigration experience and subsequent racialization. Quote, I remember being conscious of trying to say the right things in the right way so that you won't cause so much attention to yourself, either to be ridiculed or to lose an opportunity. Just being different, everything about you is looked at and either questioned, praised in a condescending way or criticized in an unfair way. That's stressful. I think it made me quiet, you know, which was kind of weird because here's this flaming young activist and then she tries to disappear in, let's say, work meetings. After all, you have other plans, you know. You get by that way. Julene draws a connection between the effects of these experiences and her cardiovascular health. You force yourself to be what you are not. You keep quiet when you know you're not a quiet person. Simmering, right? And instead of speaking up because you don't feel safe to do so. Or you calculate things. What are the trade-offs? What are the risks? These reflections indicate that race is often experienced as a master status, creating interactional quandaries and shaping social encounters in ways that require constant vigilance, careful negotiation, and calculated choices about one's presentation of self. Such racialized experiences are understood by many as with heart disease as posing cardiovascular risk through such bodily consequences as stress, suppression, and depression. Another set of factors to which many lay people attribute their heart disease are material conditions of life that are systematically shaped by race and gender. In particular, working class women of color refer to interlocking dynamics of race, class, and gender that stratify their educational opportunities and structure a racially and sex segregated labor market. Those employment opportunities available to them are largely restricted to low paying jobs with little potential for advancement, minimal job stability, and little power over their hours, pace of work, or the nature of the kind of work that they do. Mabel, for example, was a Mexican-American woman with severe hypertension whom I interviewed. She worked her entire life as a housekeeper, a home health aide, a cannery worker, and in food service. She speculates that if she had not been Mexican-American, she would have had, quote, different kinds of jobs, oh, I'm sorry, We'll get to this quote in a second. If she had not been Mexican American, she would have had, quote, a different kinds of jobs, and easier jobs, and a more calm life than I was having. Instead, Mabel suffered a lifetime of working long hours in unskilled, low paying, and physically taxing occupations. This lack of opportunities that were available to her is what she believes, quote, developed me for having high blood pressure. Everything was rush, rush to me. I started getting sick. All this running around, all this worrying about money, money, money. If you have a hard life, it stays on you. That's also a lot of anxiety, too, working in those factories, making sure that you get up in the morning, take your kids to the babysitter, wait for the bus to get there in time to work. If you're not there in time two or three times, they fire you. So all of this is too much tension for one person that's raising her kids. In short, all, uh, racism, classism, and sexism intersect to define the terms under which people of different races, classes, and sexes are made to do different kinds of work. People of color experience the consequences of such dynamics as direct determinants of their heart disease. Lay people also articulate how race shapes environmental contexts in ways that not only impose cardiovascular risks, but also limit avenues for responding to and modifying such risks. For example, some speak about the impracticality of regular exercise in unsafe neighborhoods and amidst lives with far more pressing problems than the risks of a sedentary lifestyle. David, who was diagnosed with hypertension at the age of 21 and underwent quadruple bypass surgery several decades later, 
offers a picture of some of the environmentally mediated effects of race on film. Quote, and an oppressive type of environment weakens you as an individual, and it weakens the whole race. As a product of that environment, you become deprived socially, economically, educationally, and in your health. You could look at every aspect race had an effect on you. You carry a spark for life. And I don't think it's speculative. I think it's actually a fact. When I say the environment that takes it in as a whole, you have to take in the school system, the housing, the availability of health facilities. You have to take all of these and put them into that pot. You just can't extract one. You have to put them all in there, and then you would see if that environment is oppressed. The people in that environment are gonna come out with problems, not only emotional, mental, social problems, but they're gonna come out with a multiplicity of health problems. Here, David makes an emphatic claim to authority. Through his biographical and embodied experiences, he causally links racial oppression to environmental conditions of existence and ultimately to health. He also articulates an understanding of the interlocking effects of race. It deeply affects multiple aspects of one's lived experience and environment, and any one dynamic cannot be separated from the others. Social, economic, political, and cultural infrastructures based upon representations of difference and inequality synergistically sustain and reproduce one another, and their effects are inscribed on and in the body. Finally, many of the lay participants allude to the social psychological toll imposed by the chronic denial of opportunities to people of color and to women. For example, I asked Joe, an African American who had a heart attack and bypass surgery at the age of 54, why he thinks African Americans suffer from heart disease at higher rates than do whites. He responded, I would say, very easily, suppression. Blacks are suppressed, minorities are suppressed, women are suppressed. Just give me a fair chance, that's all I'm asking for. Not to be given that chance, that's what irritates so much. That's what makes you angry, mean, nasty, and unforgiving. That's all part of the oppression thing, to be denied that chance. It's got to big with some people. There are some people who just cannot shake that, and it sticks in their craw, and it destroys them. Because that's all they've got is the opportunity. And you take away that, and there's nothing else. You can go through life saying, if I had just got the shot, or these things happen two or three times, but these things continually happen. How many times can you go through this? How many times can you turn your other cheek? How many times can you say, oh, it'll be all right, I'll get it the next time? After a while, it hammers on you, it lays on you, it beats you down, and eventually destroys you. Is it genocide? I don't know. People with heart disease thus argue that the effects of racial and gender hierarchy on their everyday interactions and the stratification of economic opportunities and material conditions impose bodily costs that produce and exacerbate illness. These links are drawn through embodied experience and they form the basis on which lay people conceptualize in multiple diverse and complex ways their race and their gender and those, the consequences they have as direct causes of heart disease. In this light, the popularity of cultural constructions of race and biological understandings of gender and epidemiology appear very problematic indeed in their neglect of the role of inequality, structural processes, and social relations of power in determining health. So more recently, I've turned my attention to thinking about the politics of causation in the wake of the Human Genome Project. As the often told story goes, a massive global public-private venture produced the first full map of the human genome in 2003. And I'm sorry, I couldn't resist yet one more cartoon of what it was we thought we were getting when they told us that they completed the map of the human genome. And actually, uh, this isn't all that far-fetched because I just found out from one of my um, epidemi genetic epidemiologist participants that someone had published a paper in the early days of of genetic research that they had found the gene um, that uh, determined people's inclination to engage in improvisational dance. And apparently you can actually look it up in the bibliographic database. There is actually a published paper about the gene for improvisational dance. So this is not all that far-fetched. Um, okay, so uh, returning back to the story. Um, but the pace and volume of genetic research since 2003 has accelerated um, while at the same time, the cost of conducting genetic research has decreased precipitously. Now, 
while the announcements in 2003, and I don't know how many of you in the audience remember this, but the big, the big story, the big headline was that there, as humans, that we all shared this deep molecular commonality, that humans were 99.9% .9 alike. But what has transpired since then has instead been a renewed interest in human biological difference. In tracing how epidemiology as a discipline continues to investigate the effects of human difference on disease causation, we've been finding that concerns around racial differences are now carefully articulated through conceptions of human genomic diversity and populations of continental ancestry. Epidemiologists we've spoken to view these conceptions as directly countering some of the methodological flaws of cultural and ethnic notions of race and matching those aspects of the cultural prism that rendered it so socially and scientifically appealing. So to explain this, recall that the notion of race as culture was attractive to epidemiologists because its fatness could be observed in measurable behaviors and beliefs and because it avoided implications of biological essentialism. But that one problem with the racial categories was that they kept changing at the time. The new lens of genomic ancestry matches each of the first two <coughs> advantages of the cultural prism, but additionally provides a solution to the problematic mutability of racial categories. So let me just address that last point first. So instead of using a set of mutable and historically contingent racial categories, a genomic definition of diversity relies upon ancestry informative markers, or aims. Aims are a set of genetic variations for a particular DNA sequence that appear in different frequencies and populations from different regions of the world. So did everybody follow that? I know it's complicated. <laughs> anyway, there's, there's a set of genetic, a specified, identified set of genetic variations that occur in different frequencies, so the theory goes depending on where, what part of what continent your ancestors come from. So these aims are used to estimate the geographical origins of an individual's ancestor, ancestors, and they can even take it to the point where they can express it as an issue of admixture, or the proportion of one's ancestry that comes from different continental regions. And so you can have people who will get this kind of AIMS testing and end up with results that look like, for example, 30% of my ancestry um, comes from the European continent, um, X percent of my ancestry comes from the Asian continent, and another percent of my um, ancestry comes from um, other geographic regions. Thus, AIMS are perceived to stably fix individuals along the spectrum of human variation in ways that social and cultural understandings of difference could not. Also, epidemiologists we've interviewed and now see the issue of multiraciality as a result transmuted into an issue of admixture, which itself is already incorporated into the very notion of this continuum of human genomic diversity. It follows then that many of our recent respondents now see human genetic variation as directly observable. You do a cheek swab, you get some blood, you get other kinds of tissue samples, you run a genetic array on it, and you come out with you know, this admixture profile. Although epidemiologists of all stripes acknowledge that there is still a great deal of uncertainty over what the significance of genetic variations are, many contend that we must confront this truth of human genetic diversity. This truth is that systematic genetic differences cluster individuals into populations of continental ancestry that roughly approximate racial groups. This is an indisputable fact epidemiologists increasingly seem to it suggest, and they use such phrases as, quote, the sky is blue, and it's beating a dead horse to underscore this newly tangible, verifiable reality. This, they claim, underscores that we need to move beyond politicized claims that there is simply no biological basis to raise. But in our interviews, epidemiologists also advocate another kind of reality check. Scientists have to let go of the clearly mistaken belief that disease etiology is mostly genetically determined. Thus, contemporary iterations of genomic diversity are not read to be essentialist or reductionist or deterministic. Evidence of the influence of social and cultural and environmental determinants on health is as irrefutable as that which supports the potential relevance of genetic factors. So epidemiologists' confrontation of these twin realities of human genetic diversity on the one hand and complex disease causation on the other 
seems to lead them to the promotion of a kind of epidemiology from the center. This position holds neither to the sinking ship of genetic determinism, nor the, to the political correctness of social determinism, but instead a professed commitment to the whole spectrum of potential disease causes. <coughs> Now this commitment to simultaneously consider genetic, cultural, environmental, behavioral, social factors seems to be part of an emerging narrative about integrated and transdisciplinary research as a new way forward for epidemiology. <coughs> and you'll see some of the language here that you just come across over and over again when you read um, commentaries about where epidemiology is now and where we need to go. The future of epidemiology and of ideological research in general, our interviews, our interviews emphasize, lies in researchers coming together from multiple disciplines with an openness to, quote, new ways of doing things, an appreciation of the complexity of the problem, a diversity of thoughts and ideas, to think globally about disease etiology, and particularly the pathways that lead to health disparities. Under this capacious vision of this transdisciplinary future, a truce in the politics of causation might seem possible. But if you think about the backdrop of history, the continuing impact of research infrastructure, funding, conventional ways of disciplinary organization, and societal notions about what kinds of difference race is, I contend that it is much too soon to declare such a truce. First, despite a rhetoric of an epidemiology from the center and of multiple and complex causation, the National Institutes of Health, for example, spends more than $7.2 billion on genetic research compared to $3.5 billion on social and behavioral research and $2.7 billion on health disparities. So in this context, do we have a balance of commitment to diverse lines of inquiry? I don't think so. This is a position that many social analysts and even some basic scientists and epidemiologists have taken. And I'm certain that all of us have heard some kind of critique like this before. But beyond this, in considering how to do research on the social side of the disease equation, and given that epidemiology is still the science of choice for public health policy and clinical decision making, we must take into account the conditions under which that kind of knowledge is being produced. Epidemiologists work within a system of rules, standardized routines, rewards, and institutional practices. Infrastructure matters for the production of any commodity, and here it is deeply consequential for the kind of scientific knowledge that is being made. The inclusion of race and sex as variables is a routinized practice not because it's seen as conceptually or methodologically robust, but because it helps to satisfy a number of contingencies that must be met in order to achieve credibility. This practice, however, legitimates individualized, astructural, and apolitical notions of difference and sustains a focus on individual risks rather than social causation. Thus, my work shows that devoting additional funding to the epidemiology of disease disparities, as critical as that is and as important a political achievement as that would be, will not be enough. Under the existing conditions of production, further epidemiologic research will continue to generate results that largely replicate what we already know about individual level risks and health-related behaviors. It will not, in contrast, tell us how complex social processes related to the representation and organization of race and gender structure like chances or how relations of power act as fundamental causes of disease, placing people defined as different at risk of risk. We need a different set of answers to this question of what difference does difference make? And for that, we need a different way of producing, of obtaining those answers, a different way of producing knowledge. And on this issue, my work highlights just how much is at stake in changing the terms of the, of the debate. Lay people's accounts of race and gender and the role that they play in heart disease offer some pretty compelling alternatives to epidemiologic thinking about difference. Those accounts support the notion that social conditions like race and gender function as fundamental causes of disease, stratifying life chances, resources, and the conditions within which health can be promoted, maintained, and run aligned. But let me be clear, I do not believe that lay accounts are more accurate reflections of reality than scientific ones. But neither is scientific knowledge any less selective, any less intentional or political than they know. Yet the scientific basis of epidemiologic claims 
mean that they carry a great deal of social credibility, a great deal of cultural legitimacy, and political power. So in that context, what kind of status do we accord lay knowledge, which has vastly different criteria for validity? And what then are the implications for the authority of science and our conventional definitions of expertise? In a knowledge stratified society, expertise is a critical resource in the struggle for status and privilege, and thus the bases of expertise and its acquisition are fiercely defended domains. Questions of the place that scientific expertise occupies in society and of the conduct of science are all questions about power. Even seemingly esoteric debates about epidemiologic methods are embedded with assumptions, practices, and frameworks that are thoroughly political and social. And in this case, epidemiology constructs common sense, power-related notions about the natural effects of differences on health. The controversy over the relationship of race or other kinds of social and human differences to disease involves political contestations in which power, resources, identities, worldviews, and much more are all at stake. Thus, remaking race in our investigations involves fundamentally rethinking our definitions of expertise, of knowledge, and of credibility. <clears throat> So to conclude, in this complicated and evolving situation, it's imperative for those of us who care about understanding race as an axis of stratification, as an arena for meaning making and identity construction, and as the grounds for staking claims to resources, and as symbols that encapsulate debates about inequality and difference, we all have to be involved. Most obviously, this means initiating and contributing to conversation about the social production and causation of disease. But this also means analyzing why people imbue difference with such different meanings, calling attention to the ramifications of our standards of authoritative knowledge, and problematizing those criteria that hinder our efforts to improve societal well-being. In the pursuit of equity in the health, we have to recognize that both disease and difference are socially created. Recognizing that debates about disease causes are political contestations, and understanding where we might intervene in those politics are steps towards imagining how things could be otherwise. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Hello, I'm Marita campos Maledi. I'm in psychology. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate in psychology. Uh, this was a wonderful talk, and your research was extremely insightful and exciting. Um, there are a lot of people here that I know are involved in research, either in producing research or at least in interpreting it in different fields. And like in epidemiology, I think that most of our fields seem kind of construe race in, in the same fashion. Um, and it's sort of a stock variable that gets put in because it seems necessary. Um, but these conceptualizations are so ingrained in the field uh, at the institutional level. I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations for individual researchers and what we can do to advocate for an, an unpacking of that race variable and a more thorough analysis in our own fields. And for example, um, you mentioned the uh, new uh, genetic uh, conceptualizations of, that, that might be uh, of use in epidemiology. Do you think that that sort of thing would be of use in more of the social sciences as well? So that's my first question. Um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a question that I've been wrestling with for a very long time. Um, it's, um, I mean, I'm a sociologist, and I recognize these tendencies in sociology as well, in particular in medical sociology and public health research and other kinds of you know, fields that I've been involved in. Um, and I think that's something that you, the, the way that you phrase your question, therein lies the answer. You asked about recommendations for unpacking you know, variables like race. And I think that's exactly what needs to happen. Um, one of the things that I mentioned in my talk was that oftentimes when epidemiologists find that there are these racial differences, they control for, you know, they adjust for um, racial race, for example, or ethnicity, or they analyze data by race and they find that, that it does change what the outcomes look like. They sort of see that as, um, you know, an explanation unto itself. But what I'm trying to argue is that that's actually the point, that's the point at which you start, need to start to ask further questions. What is it exactly about race? Race is such a huge umbrella, vague, 
underdetermined label for so many things that are going on. Um, and there's certain things about epidemiology. Um, epidemiology, and I think a lot of you know, the quantitative research that goes on, we like variables to be discrete. We like them to be mutually exclusive. Um, and we're really interested, in for good reason, I think, in trying to unpack, okay, how much of this outcome is about race? How much of this outcome is perhaps about socioeconomic status? How much of this outcome is about behaviors? We want to unpack. Um, we want to be able to discern you know, what is contributing to how much of this overall problem. And I think that you know, when you look at the quotes that I, I put up um, from, the, from um, lay folks who have heart disease, um, race and views has this all-encompassing um, effect. And it affects so many, like, da like the, uh, my participant, who I named David, was saying, you can't just extract one out of, you know, it's all part of the piece. Um, and I think that there are ways in which, um, you know, epidemiology needs to come to some sort of methodological and conceptual terms with how it is that we can think about a fundamental cause like race, and then the next level being how do we discern methodologically all the different ways in which it is happening. So rather than trying to pull apart race from other kinds of things, it's actually incorporating race back into the pathways of, of complex causation um, for these kinds. Um, you asked about the genetic, uh, some of the genetic um, research. Honestly, I'm not so sure. You know, I think that um, there has been a lot of research that has been done that has tried to look at, um, you know, the global picture of where people are from. Um, and they tell me that they could look at a person's genome and they can actually identify this part of your genome, you know, so we have the whole double helix here, right? This part of your genome comes from your, um, your Asian ancestry. This other part of your genome comes from your European ancestry. This other part of your genome comes from your African ancestry. They're able to identify specific pieces of your individual genome as coming from, as having origins in different continents. There's been a lot of sort of, you know, some people call it like a fishing expedition, you know, sort of casting a net and trying to figure out are there genes that are both associated with race, <coughs> ethnicity, continental ancestry, and associated with disease. The picture is very, very murky. And what a lot of people have come to realize that it's so complicated and any one gene or genetic variation contributes to such a little part of the part of the picture that we are decades and decades away from coming to any sort of scientific conclusions about genomic diversity and its impact on health disparities. So then the converse, then the critique becomes, we already know a lot about, for example, <coughs> racial discrimination. We already know a lot about the socioeconomic gradient and how. You know, we already, there are things that we already know, that we already have um, evidence on um, that can make a difference in terms of health disparities and make a difference in terms of disease distribution. Um, so given that, does it make sense that we spend seven, or that the NIH spends $7.2 billion in genetic research and only $3.5 billion in social behavior research? Mm -hmm. I think that's a question that we all need to be able to Hi, I'm Lisa Kluge. I'm uh, one of the nursing Robert Wood Johnson fellows uh, paying my PhD here, and I, I just wanted to piggyback onto what you just said, because my question aligns with that, because I think that racial disparities really fall, I mean, they're qualitative in nature, and I think until the research um, world really grabs a hold of that, then we're going to continue to see those disparities and where the funding goes, because I really think that looking at those qualitative aspects of what goes on, all of those stories that you told, we'll really find the answer there, not in looking at things <coughs> and things like that. You're already saying that that's very murky. And I think the, the, the segue here, or the enlightenment, is really in looking at more quality research and getting the funding to do that, because that soft science is very much um, underappreciated. But I think hopefully we're going, going in a way where, where that's going to become a turning point for the science of what we're trying to do here. I mean, one of the things that, 
I suspected going into this research, but I just came to realize more and more is that even though I use words like you know epidemiology or the discipline of epidemiology or ep epidemiologic experts, like the world of epidemiology is a very very diverse place. It's a very heterogeneous place, and there are people that I've interviewed or that I've encountered and you know in the course of doing my research who would absolutely agree with everything that I just said. <coughs> at the end of the day, they told they say that they are epidemiologists and they're held to a different set of criteria of what con what constitutes science in their world. And so even though they think and conceptualize race and social difference in terms of inequality and discrimination and marginalization and all of these other things that lay people also reflect, at the end of the day, they still have to practice epidemiology in these you know, defined kinds of ways. So in some levels, there's a great diversity in the ways that epidemiologists think, but a much, much more narrow range of the practices that they engage with. And of course, it's the practices that they engage with that produces the knowledge that they disseminate. Let me invite Professor Steve Bunny to uh, either make a comment or a commentary or ask a question. <laughs> Sir, thanks. I'm Steve Bunny, I'm associate professor in psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, thank you so much for a very insightful and, and thorough um, presentation of some very really complex issues. And I was struck between several different points um, in my own work and, and uh, some of the things I've encountered. Uh, but I'll stick to one kind of one area, not really a question, but a comment. But actually, I would like your your input and your experience on the kind of this dialogue. Uh, at the national level and the international level. I'll tell you why. I teach a cross-cultural psychology class that we graduate students. And so we look at the universal aspects of psychology and the cultural specific aspects. And I really try to get the students to think along both lines. Um, and one thing I've noticed both in teaching that class and in dialogues with other colleagues, faculty, and researchers, and in interactions with NIH, <laughs> is that um, uh, this it goes from either to or. So either it's the universal level that humans are all alike, or to a very individualistic level. But that is that person's experience. It is really difficult for our nation, it seems, to me to stay on a topic of a group level uh, area such as race and ethnicity. And so I was just wondering what kind of experiences you've had with that and what kind of changes have you seen over the last few years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would totally agree with you that we have this sort of myopic, sort of flip-flopping between either sort of everybody's the same and whatever we discover about one population has some generalizability to other populations versus the opposite rhetoric that you know we have to get everybody at the individual level. I mean, in terms of um, like research on disease causation, I think, and especially with the Human Genome Project and sort of you know this genomic or post-genomic era that we live in, the emphasis on getting to the individual is that drumbeat. I think has gotten louder and louder because. The promise and the reason why um, you know, we as taxpayers all <coughs> bought into the Human Genome Project was that the idea that eventually it would get it to a point where we would have personalized genomics. You know, personalized their, you know, drugs that were customized to your own genetic profile um, and that um, you know, would be able to work. Um, so you, you would be able to diminish the side effects, you would have you know, efficacy based on individual genetic profiles, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you asked me about changes over the last couple of years. I think that individualistic ethos has gotten, um, has, has gotten bigger and bigger. And in a funny kind of way, I think that's actually contributed to, um, I mean, it's, it's now become, it's not so much you know, <coughs> two opposing arguments, so much as that it's, it's now sort of two sides of the same coin. If, for example, you have, human beings who are 99.9% .9 alike, genetically speaking. 
Um, then, of course, rather than focusing on the 99.9% .9 that makes us all alike, a lot of geneticists are focusing on the you know, 0.1% that makes us different from one another. Rather than going at it from a categorical kind of um, approach, you know, sort of a group-based approach, um, people are thinking about using these populations of genetic ancestry not as a means unto itself. In other words, you know, if you, predominantly you can trace your ancestry to the European subcontinent, then X, Y, and Z will follow. They only see that kind of group-based approach as being a way station to get into the individualistic approach. So to the extent that we can slice and dice the population, all of us, and more and more finely, that is why. That is how we'll get to an individualistic um, um, ethos. And it sort of flattens everybody out in the sense that, well, we're all different from one another, as opposed to thinking, okay, yes, that is true, but some of us are systematically differentiated in certain kinds of ways that has implications for our home. Um, and so that's why, you know, I think the jury is, the jury's gonna is still out and will be out for a long time about the, the importance of genomics and where it takes us. And there's actually lots of really interesting, um, like there are sociologists who are trying to work with geneticists to thinking about it like a combined social and, and genetic um, uh, kinds of studies. So there's a lot of really interesting sort of hybridized cross-disciplinary transdisciplinary work going on. Um, but then again, I, you know, I keep going back to the fact that, well, um, okay, genes may be important, but society is also really important too. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and in terms of disease causation, like those are the kinds of things that we need to, that we need to think more carefully about and try to, you know, just try to do better. Um, um, and I think that qualitative research has something to do with it. Um, if you ask, a lot of epidemiologists are really intrigued by qualitative ethnographic um, um, approaches. And a lot of them will say, like, uh, one of the questions that I often ask is sort of, if you, money aside, if you were to design your ideal study, what would it look like? And they are almost to a person will say things like, I would want to take um, a huge, take a large group, follow them from sort of birth all the way to the end of their life, follow the next generation of their children, because they really want sort of this historical, intergenerational understanding of um, how disease happens. Um, but again, you know, logistically and funding-wise, it's very hard.
it's also like pregnant cancer. It's, it is, yes, yes. If it weren't limited, limited to a small, almost, a small community, almost 100% white. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's something to say for homogeneity, too. Mm -hmm. uh, let me invite others to, to engage in this discussion. And I'll let you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, along the lines of the first question that, that we had, um, it seems there's plenty of data out there to suggest the importance of genetic sources in environmental practices. But the problem appears to people not being able to integrate that into this kind of mass um, consensus on what reality is. So what? What I'm thinking is that, um, kind of like Galileo, you know, yeah. is the sun traveling around the earth? Yeah. And if we know that to be true, no matter what else we say, we have to go back to the brain. So science is embedded in its own mm -hmm. knowledge attitudes and practices. Mm -hmm. But you know, the importance of disease among our genetic, again, identically, um, genetically identical twins is less than 50%. Mm -hmm. And then the, the immigrant effect, which mm -hmm. everybody acknowledges, you know, you come from some other country, you come to the United States, you're healthy, but many generations later, all of a sudden, you're part of those demographics. Or you're just one generation. Or, or one generation. Yeah. 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 So, we, again, we know these facts are not scientifically disputed, and yet the ability to incorporate that into thinking seems to be limited by this, you know, um, consent, the, the scientific consensus that's really a belief system that we can't penetrate. Mm -hmm. So the thoughts about how to actually get traction and move that, mm -hmm. um, especially in an academic environment where, as you were saying, it's almost impossible to even put those facts out and then figure out how to get them incorporated. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, one of the areas in which my research has sort of led me to thinking more about is, um, you know, so we have all this purportedly multidisciplinary trans thinking about, okay, just trying to problematize that a little bit. You know, yes, it's transdisciplinary, and yes, it's important, but what exactly do these multiple disciplines who are involved in it share with one another, as opposed to, you know, the ways in which they might think differently? Um, and I would argue that in a lot of transdisciplinary collaborations that I've seen, um, as a matter of fact, they share a whole lot more than they are, you know, than they are differentiated from one another. Um, the other thing too is that um, you know you brought up a lot of really complicated issues, and and, um, and I think that um, one of the other things that that came to mind when you were talking is that um, there are a lot of like even if when you talk to geneticists, and they will completely acknowledge that gene environment interactions are important, even environment unto itself is really important. Um, they're completely stymied when it comes to how do we measure the environment? What do we even mean by the environment? And so they go back to the kind of environment that they know. For example, some of the geneticists that I've been following, um, and these are geneticists, genetic epidemiologists, epidemiologists who have gotten involved in using genetic um, methodologies in their work. For example, they'll, they'll say that they're looking at gene environment interactions when they're actually looking at the cellular environment. Not this whole social environment that, we, that we're thinking about here. You know, the, what happens in between two individuals, two groups in a society, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, the, that's as far as their reach can go. And they will readily admit that it is an extremely limited reach. But if their point is that there is so much that we don't know. And methodologically, it's an incredibly complicated thing to not only look at um, a set of independent variables, and their impact on a set of dependent variables, but then on top of that to look at interactions among independent variables, you know, what were thought of as independent variables, and to see what their impact is on. And so you'll see that, um, I don't know if any of you belong to Kaiser Permanente, but Kaiser has a huge effort underway to enroll its patients in what they call the, um, it's called the Gene, Health, and Environment Study. So the way forward for a lot of people is in these massive, huge um, 
studies of people where they're doing a whole battery of um, you know, health habits, health behaviors, uh, risk factors, um, family history, they'll get a cheek swab or some other kind of you know, um, biospecimen from you. And the idea is that if we build a database big enough, and if we get enough people in the sample, that we'll start to be able to tease out some of these things. What I think that that research doesn't get at is the fact that you're not touching any of the criteria by which we think of science as being proof of what we even think about as being scientific. Um, you know, it still adheres to a lot of the under, our typical routine understandings of, of uh, credibility and of validity. And until we change the terms of the debate to be about those kinds of things and not about just, you know, bigger, more data, um, then I think we'll keep falling into the same pitfalls of this very incremental notion of, um, of what, you know, we'll have yet another small risk factor that contributes a very small proportion to our risk factor for whatever disease. Um, I was just thinking about the NIH study that you so sorely disappointed mm -hmm. in their few words they had to say about the environment. Yeah. And I, I, it seemed like their lens wasn't even that kind of lens. They weren't even looking for that. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want to put your mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. I think it was, I might be misquoting here, but I actually do remember hearing from somebody that, that drafts of that report that were being circulated um, had a whole lot more on environment in there. And through successive editing and as it made its way up the food chain before public release, all of those, a lot of that mention got taken off bit by bit. Um, you know, it's a story that's not all that surprising. Um, you know, yes on the one hand. On the other hand, there are, um, there is a generation of breast cancer scientists who are um, really interested in doing um, participatory, you know, um, who are interested in doing science in a different kind of way. That it's not just about science. Sci not only scientists do science. Um, that are, who are um, interested in forging uh, associations and relationships with um, activists, with community-based groups, um, with lay people. Um, and I think that that's actually, um, you know, as this project sort of keeps evolving, that's another area in which I'm really interested in exploring, is what does this supposed citizen science look like? What do these scientist-citizen alliances look like? What does sort of the structures of power actually, who gets to participate when and in what? Um, a student of mine looked at one such alliance. Um, it was in, it's actually at NIH and NIEH, which is the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which is a, uh, one of the institutes of NIH, um, funded a whole series of centers across the country uh, where um, centers were set up to look at both environmental, to, to look at all the multiple causation, co potential causes of breast cancer, including environmental ones. And, um, and um, embedded within the structure of the funding mechanism itself was a real uh, demand and commitment that much closer connections be forged with activists, with consumers, um, and you know other entities that are usually not at the table in terms of conducting science itself. Um, and my what my student found was that yes, um, activists did become involved more in doing um, and conducting the science than has typically is as than is typically the case. But what ends up happening is that there ends up being sort of this hierarchicalization amongst the activists themselves. So you have the expert scientist activists who are then become sort of liaisons with like the wider activist community. And that just really begs the question of, okay, how participatory is this? Is this really democratizing science? Are they in fact conducting science in any different kind of ways than, than have been conducted before? Um, you know, for the most part, it was scientists inviting the activists to come to their table on their terms to do science in their kinds of ways. Um, so, you know, all this is to say that there's, a, I think there is some amount of experimentation that's going on in terms of how to structure 
this kind of research, um, but I think it really bears further investigation and careful investigation as to how much of this is really different. You know, or just to raise the question of, not that it's different or not different, but just to raise the question, in what ways is it different, and in what ways is it you know, not so different? Okay. Um, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And you know, it's gotten me thinking about Foucault's book, Birth of the Clinic, mm -hmm. where he really argues that with the advent of biomedicine, and the rise and the dominance of physicians, that everything social was pushed into the internal dimension of the body. And in the, the quotes from your research from uh, lay people, I saw that kind of theme that might actually be interesting to, to uh, inform behavioral level interventions in communities of color is, is this theme that the effects of racism have to be continually suppressed, mm -hmm. internalized mm -hmm. by individual people to cope and, and, and live. Mm -hmm. um, and that your research gives people an opportunity to narrativize race and its effects race and racism, um, and that that is an externalizing, socializing process uh, that transforms race from something that has to be kept inside, understood as genetic, um, understood even as cultural heritage, um, and that through narration about disease and as, as one effect of race and racism um, actually becomes a, a, an externalizing of race and transforming it. So I just want to highlight that because to do that qualitative analysis of how people's narratives about the suppressiveness of race um, could inform uh, interventions. Yeah. No, Prevention and, and treatment and hoping. It's really interesting that you, great, that you bring that up and I thank you for, um, for raising it. Um, you know, there's another kind of sort of individualization that's going on now. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Nancy Krieger's work. She's a social epidemiologist um, and she, you know, she's, I mean, for the most part, she talks like a sociologist. She's written Marx before, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, she wrote this volume, and she's trying to promote this idea of embodied inequality. Um, this notion that um, when you experience um, sort of chronic, lifelong, repeated conditions and exposures of inequality and discrimination and racism and other kinds of social forces, that you know that they have an embodied an in effect um, on you, and it's and in it, and in trying to articulate exposure to those kinds of things and, and the sort of figuring out all the different pathways to which they come to have bodily, biological, physiological effects on you, that that is one sort of avenue that social epidemiologists can make a case for how social conditions are fundamental causes of disease. And on the one hand, I respect that and I think that that's a great direction to go. On the other hand, I've seen other epidemiologists take that up, is that, you know, the sense it's like, well, if we find the right biomarker, for what it is, you know, when somebody is exposed to discrimination and we find the right biomarker that, you know, that responds to that, um, then the intervention becomes the biomarker itself, not the larger condition that gave rise to, you know, to that biomarker. So, there's that going on. Well. Let me invite everybody to thank uh, Professor Shin for the presentation. <laughs> It's a children's book uh, about a real life story about uh, smallpox uh, that took place, uh, an epidemic that took place here in, in New Mexico not so long ago, in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, but um, anyway, this Thank is a so memento of your visit. Thank you. I've so seen the art you. on the wall, so it's great to have a copy of this.
Thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you for your question. Thank you for coming.